is the first part of the lecture on oral manifestation of systemic diseases. I am Dr. Lahari Etelang and uh, from the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology. So <clears throat> the learning outcomes would be to recognize oral manifestation of systemic diseases, outline the oral health considerations and dental management of patient with the following conditions. Um, <clears throat> we will be looking at some of these uh, most important conditions like respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, gastrointestinal, renal, hematological, uh, touching up a little bit on bleeding and clotting, infectious diseases, metabolic as well as endocrine diseases. Of course, we'll also be giving you an outline on uh, oral manifestations of HIV and AIDS, which you have already uh, dealt with when you were in year three and some examples of uh, uh, heart and a little bit about uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, the relationship of the oral cavity and general health is very important. Now, this is because, first of all, abnormal oral finding could present an oral manifestation of systemic disease. The example for this sort of abnormal finding could be enlarged gingiva. Uh, that can be due to leukemic gingivitis, for example. So, as an oral health care provider, this enlargement of gingiva could actually lead the dentist to be the one uh, you know aiding in the diagnosis of uh, leukemic gingivitis for example nextly history taking and other information for example lab records physician records help determine the extent to which the patient's medical status allowed them to tolerate stressful dental treatment that is um, uh, let's say you have a patient who is having unstable angina so I I history taking becomes very important in this sort of so sort of a case because the probably chair position or length of treatment um, and how the patient is able to tolerate uh, stressful dental appointments uh, maybe a painful extraction or even a minor oral surgery all depends on the medical condition of the patient and condition at that particular point in time during treatment next patient's dental status directly or indirectly affects their medical status now when we're talking about directly or indirectly um, let's say for example you have an edentulous patient uh, edentulism leads to poor nutrition especially in elderly patients and this can be a cause of concern because uh, some patients would because they're not able to chew some uh, foods some of the foods they tend to avoid those foods which could lead to some a sort of malnourishment because you're deliberately avoiding hard food which you're not able to chew and end up eating softer food which mostly fall in the range of carbohydrates and which may not be very good for health uh, periodontal disease for example has been proposed as a risk factor for vascular disease and that we all know that uh, a poor gum health could be related to um, uh, you know the oral plaque the bacterial oral plaque causing uh, problems in uh, <clears throat> like um, you know in the cardiovascular system so th these are some of the examples of how oral cavity and general health the relationship is important Let's uh, move on to the next, uh, which is reasons for taking medical history. <clears throat> Often, um, when you are actually starting to treat off a patient, many a times you would have noticed your lecturers uh, stressing on the question that did you ask the history again? That becomes a very important point because many a time dentists are so engrossed in the teeth that they forget that they're actually treating a human being. So this is very important to notice that time to time, whenever your patient comes back for a next appointment, review appointment, or after a few months later, it's important to review their medical history because medical history can change. Um, <clears throat> and it could just be a small episode of uh, um, a change which patient has forgotten to mention you. For example, patient has not been diabetic all this while and suddenly turns diabetic. It's important that the dentist knows that. So health problems might alter dental management of the patient. Um, now, there could be various situations in this. Situation one is patient is aware of the medical health problem. That's very good. That's a very clear situation. Patient knows his medical condition, knows what medications he's taking, knows what is his blood sugar level. Very good. It's, you're, you're on the safe side. You know what you're dealing with. Situation two, patient is not aware of the systemic condition. That means uh, you are looking at a patient uh, where he is not uh, doesn't know and probably you are also not sure what the medical condition is and then you end up diagnosing it for the patient and then refer the patient for 
medical care so uh, the example for that would be hiv oral signs and symptoms which are the first to appear uh, in the oral cavity situation 3 patient is aware of the medical condition but does not want to disclose now that is a very very difficult patient very difficult situation because they don't want to tell you uh, example is drug abuse now this is the same example uh, which we are facing in the current situation uh, you know in relation to the uh, covid-19 where patients don't want to declare that they've had uh, you know uh, some sort of an exposure or could be you know have uh, exposure to a patient <clears throat> with a history reasons for taking medical history which i'm continuing is another thing is medical disorders can result in emergencies in dental office now that's a very serious issue uh, that means a patient for example a diabetic patient experiencing a hypoglycemic episode or a cardiovascular patient experiencing angina during a stressful dental appointment so when you talk about stressful dental appointments the most commonest example that comes to my mind is dental extractions or a procedure which you may not think is stressful but even a simple local anesthetic injection could uh, actually cause a lot of anxiety in the patient who is already having a known medical condition or probably who has dental phobia now certain patients need medication before invasive dental procedures example patient is at risk of infective endocarditis they are recommended antibiotic prophylaxis before dental procedure so it's important that you go through the medical history of the patient and take a thorough medical history on every appointment that you're seeing the patient if not every appointment at least after every few weeks or few months that you're seeing the patient let's look at some case scenarios to uh, you know better understand the situation and uh, you know a problem oriented approach to identify systemic disease so this is the case of a 24 year old non english speaking vietnamese man um, presented alone to the dental clinic with a chief complaint of non healing bilateral ulcers on his tongue since two weeks and uh, it's very strange actually to see bilateral ulcers at the same time you will obviously search for more ulcers in the oral cavity and when you don't find them it's it's quite tricky he had moved recently to malaysia with from vietnam with his girlfriend he denied any medical problems medication or history of trauma cough smoking or alcohol abuse as a, this is a <coughs> picture of the uh, um, you know one of the ulcers that is seen on the lateral border of the tongue The differential diagnosis list included squamous cell carcinoma, simple traumatic ulcer, tuberculosis, STDs, so many of them. But all of these were considered unlikely given the medical history obtained through a translator. Okay, so on the next visit, the dental cl- to the dental clinic five days later, the patient's girlfriend revealed that he had a long history of grand mal seizures. She stated he refused to take his medication and had multiple seizures the past several weeks. He believed that epilepsy was a psychiatric illness and his cultural background prevented him from admitting to a psychological problem. So what do we understand from this case? This case reveals the importance of persistence with medical history to identify a systematic uh, systemic problem that is manifesting in the oral cavity. Very very strange but this this kind of cases do happen and this these these are kind of cases we do see in our clinic. So it's important had we just left it that way or oh, it must have just been a traumatic ulcer so give him some topical analgesic or a anesthetic gel and just leave it you might actually end up uh, having a case a patient who might end up having a seizure on your chair and you're totally uh, taken by surprise because we did not know the medical history of the patient. So that's why it's important to persist and ask again if you know uh, there is suspicion that happens so the the very fact that the patient had bilateral ulcers should have you know um, probably triggered the uh, thought that he must have bitten his tongue during the seizure and that's how bilaterally both sides of the ulcer uh, tongue has got traumatized uh, another case a 41 year old woman presented to the dental clinic with an asymptomatic swelling of the right lower face of 5 days She was on a holiday visit to Penang from Melbourne. She was not being followed for any medical problems and she denied taking any medication or any history of trauma or toothache. Now this is a picture of the lady and you see that there's an extra oral appearance or is highly suggestive of an odontogenic abscess. You would generally think it probably is a DK2 then you're having a, a swelling here but there was no posterior teeth on the right side clinically or radiographically. I mean you've taken a radiograph and you suspected there are no teeth uh, impacted either 
Further history taking revealed that this swelling arose over a one to two hour period and they, that it has occurred once about two years earlier. So then she had the similar kind of swelling two years ago. Previous episode lasted about seven to ten days and disappeared in about few hours. That's very surprising, very strange to have a swelling which disappears. On further examination, a pulsatile sound could be heard through the face with a stethoscope. The patient was referred back to her physician in Melbourne and was suspected <clears throat> and subsequently sorry, found to have an arteriovenous malformation. This case demonstrates the importance of medical history and HOPI. If there had been a teeth in the area, uh, it had been teeth in the area and odontogenic abscess would have been considered. If the swelling was incised, there would likely have been facial arterial bleeding as a result. And that's a disaster because you would have uh, uncontrolled bleeding and uh, could become, could lead to an emergency. So now um, these two cases I have, I hope uh, uh, made you understand that it's important to take medical history and HOPI and be persistent with the history if your patient is not revealing uh, the details that you want him or her to reveal. Now let's move on to HIV or AIDS. <clears throat> um, we've known enough about this disease already, um, but it's important for us to again mention here. Uh, oral lesions associated with HIV or AIDS. Uh, oral manifestations are the earliest and most important indicators and oral manifestations can be used to predict the progression of the disease as well as to monitor treatment. Now that's the reason why dentists play a very important role in uh, monitoring and even identifying of patients. Now this is the Claringhouse uh, classification of oral infections associated with HIV. You are all very well aware of this classification. Uh, there are lesions which are strongly associated with HIV, uh, in which the most common uh, group, uh, you know, it comprises of candida, hairy leukoplakia, Kaposi's sarcoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and of course, periodontal diseases. Then you have lesions less commonly associated, the bacterial infections, melanotic uh, pigmentation, etc. And uh, lesions seen in HIV infections, which are also, again, uh, examples like, you know, uh, cat scratch disease and viral infections etc so keeping this in mind let's just go through some images to show you how uh, lesions would appear in a patient with hiv this is uh, oral candidiasis you're all very familiar it could be the erythematous or uh, a pseudomembranous and then you would see in these images that the lesions are more full-blown very very severe and uh, widespread and looking more um, serious than a normal presentation would be uh, you would see hairy leukoplakia the classical picture that comes to your mind would be a lesion on the lateral border of the tongue uh, <clears throat> very closely uh, similar to oral leukoplakia plaque like appearance but the best part is this disease is not potentially malignant it's caused by Epstein-Barr virus and once it can you be used as a prognostic indicator and if the patient is put on heart which is uh, the antiretroviral therapy actually this lesions can subside periodontal disease um, the common examples are linear uh, gingival erythema necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis and next Kaposi sarcoma this is a picture showing you a red uh, raised uh, lesion seen on the palate uh, one of the common manifestations in the oral cavity this should come to your mind, Kaposi sarcoma. So all of this is seen in, uh, <clears throat> commonly seen in patients manifesting oral manifestations of HIV. Now, heart means highly active antiretroviral therapy. Uh, it's a combination of several antiretroviral medicines used to slow down the rate of HIV. And generally, a combination of three or more uh, drugs is used, which is, is mo considered more effective than monotherapy. Now we've come a long way since the heart was actually introduced and the drugs are more uh, successful now and we've even heard of uh, the first few patients who have actually successfully been completely treated with HIV uh, in the recent uh, years. So these are some examples of the drugs which are available as uh, heart. They are uh, under various categories. You, have, you are familiar with these terms. Uh, <clears throat> nucleoside uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, fusion uh, and entry inhibitors, and um, integrate inhibitors. 
so the uh, it would be nice for you to look at this website the uh, world aids day is december 1st and uh, it uh, malaysia is nearly uh, getting to zero and that's a very good thing and the malaysian aids council is a very active association uh, you should see their website for more information role of the dental professional in managing a patient with hiv first of all identifying hiv positive patients in industrialized countries uh, you know is, is the more common lesions that you would likely to encounter in a patient and suspect hiv are oral candidiasis and oral hair leukoplakia whereas in resource poor countries oral candidiasis noma herpes zoster would be the more common infections early diagnosis for prompt treatment especially in uh, ulcerative gingivitis and necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis to appreciate prognostic significance of oral lesions and diet counseling very important uh, all of this is um, the role of the dental professional let's move on to the disease of the renal system and oral manifestations <clears throat> now this is a familiar picture again you've learned this in anatomy and these are the kidneys uh and then the uh, anatomical uh, you know uh, <clears throat> details of the kidneys oral manifestations of I, i'm only going through the oral manifestations reason being i assume that you already aware of the function of the kidneys and the uh, renal system so we won't be going into all those details what is important now is how you would deal patients with the renal problem in a dental setting so if you look at the oral manifestations of impaired renal function and a patient on dialysis <clears throat> most of the cases 90% of the cases have symptoms of uremia means excess amount of urea circulating in the blood and that's the reason why you need to do dialysis for these patients to take out that excessive toxin which is circulating in the blood in simple layman terms so most of these patients are generally receiving dialysis uh two to three times a day uh, three times a week sorry and uh, the dialysis procedure could last for about 5 to 5 hours or so and uh, some of the oral manifestations not all patients will manifest with all of the oral manifestations that are listed here but they could be having one of one or more of these so in uremic stomatitis what do we see high concentrations of urea in saliva and its breakdown into ammonia because of which blood what happens is uh, blood uh, urea nitrogen levels are greater than 150 mg per deciliter which is generally in a normal patient's eight around 8 to 18 and patients who are having renal failure should be around greater than 50 so if you're having greater than 150 mg per deciliter bun levels then you're likely to see uremic stomatitis how is the manifestation there could be chemical burn like lesions in the oral cavity with general loss of tissue resilience and ability to withstand normal and traumatic influences uremic frost white plaques of residual urea crystals and uh, oral muco in the oral mucosa and skin and large salivary glands reduce salivary flow dry mouth and when you have dry mouth what should we think of we should be thinking of caries and um, also periodontal disease so this is an example of a picture which showing you uremic frost this is in fact a, a chemical burn uh, it is scrapable uh, white plaque like and uh, having a typical uremic odor and uh, patient may or may not experience pain surprisingly these patients have low caries activity in spite of having dry mouth reason being high salivary nitrogen content so uh <clears throat> but again uh, it is not necessarily true because some of these patients would also have a component of neglect and um, so that's why caries uh, activity is something more than uh, Uh, necessarily what we're right seeing here metallic taste urea odor of breath enamel hypoplasia brown staining gingival inflammation petechiae and ecchymosis and bleeding from gingiva obviously your renal function is not uh, functioning properly so there could be alterations with the uh, <clears throat> bleeding functions also and poor wound healing burning and tendon tenderness of mucosa and glossitis and candida infection of course candida will always be there when you're having an opportunity this is a uh, case from our clinic which shows you excessive amount of gingival enlargement not uniform uh, erythematous gingiva and uh, this is a patient who was receiving renal dialysis so the radiographic manifestations are generally related to renal osteodystrophy uh or they are secondary to hyperparathyroidism 
which uh, generally happens late in the course of the disease. Uh, there is bone demineralization, loss of bony trabeculae, loss of lamina dura, ground glass appearance of the bone. So all of this is very similar to a brown tumor which you see in hyperparathyroidism. Areas of uh, containing areas of old hemorrhage which appear brown on clinical examination. And you could have giant cell lesions in the bone which are similar in histological appearance to central giant cell granuloma, giant cell reparative granuloma and osteoclastic resorption of bone and replacement by vascular connective tissue. So uh, this is a picture of a brown tumor because it appears brown, not, not named after anyone, simply because of the hemorrhagic areas. Loss of lamina dura and demineralization of the bone happening here and that's why the bone is looking more radiolucent. This is a similar example of a case which I had shown you in one of the lectures previously. This is due to hyperparathyroidism and can lead to a large bony defect uh, in picture B. And on picture D, you are seeing that the bony defect is actually healing after the patient has recovered. This is also an example of salt and pepper appearance and normal skin after treatment. So when the renal function improves, automatically the bone also heals. So patients could also have tooth mobility, metastatic soft tissue calcifications um, in the arterial or oral region and malocclusion, socket sclerosis, which is uh, lack of lamina dura, uh, resorption and uh, deposition of sclerotic bone in the extraction sockets. So this is a very important aspect that is dental consideration and management of renal diseases. Treatment on the day after dialysis, very important. Uh, the patient uh, when he or she has been on, uh, to dialysis that day it could be a very stressful and tireful, tiring day for the patient and hence if you have scheduled dental treatment it should be on the day after dialysis antibiotic prophylaxis may need to be considered for procedures which may involve uh, surgical uh, treatment avoid taking blood pressure on the uh, or giving an injection in the arm which has a vascular access to dialysis generally the port of the dialysis could be either on the arm or near the neck and so if the patient has it on the right arm then it's better you take the blood pressure or giving an injection on the left arm because simply because the right arm would, could be painful evaluate uh, <coughs> sorry hypertension or hypotension on every appointment that you are uh, treating this patient Hemostatic agents like vasopressin or conjugated estrogen or tranexamic acid may need to be kept handy in case you're expecting bleeding and to control the bleeding. Routine uh, annual dental radiographs in cases of uh, where you're monitoring these patients over a long period of time to monitor for renal osteodystrophy. So bony changes will be evident if you take a panoramic radiograph and monitor the uh, bone of these patients. Of course, it's important to take consideration to xerostomia and uh, and hence uh, uh, accordingly um, you know uh, probably some fluoride treatment as well as uh, uh, taking care of diet of these patients is important adjusting dosage of medications like especially like uh, NSAIDs because you do all of these drugs are eliminated through the renal system and hence uh, you wouldn't want to load the kidneys further Moving on to diseases of respiratory system and oral manifestations. Uh, again, I will be covering only few of the most uh, likely respiratory disorders uh, here. This chapter doesn't necessarily con uh, you know, uh, talk about the latest uh, COVID-19 infection. We would have to look at that separately. But this, 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 con uh, this chapter, this part of the lecture includes most of the common uh, respiratory disorders. Um, disease of the respiratory tract and oral cavity and the oral the concerns are oral cavity is contiguous with uh, the trachea and lower airway so they're they're connected like you can see in this picture here so the oral bacteria are the causative pathogens in respiratory disease so they just get into the oral cavity and from the oral cavity go on to the respiratory system so chemotherapeutic agents used are common and, and hence they could be antibiotic resistance developing. So if you're having a dental abscess on one hand and ENT problem in the, on the other hand, so a common antibiotic could actually help. Respiratory illnesses, example asthma, can affect orofacial morphology and dentition. I think you must have read about that in orthodont or orthodontics. Transmission of pathogens from patient to healthcare worker and vice versa. Now that we've had in enough discussion about that, I'm sure, because we're talking about droplet infections that is, can spread through the respiratory tract to the oral healthcare provider, from the oral healthcare provider to the patient. 
Upper respiratory tract infection, for example, common cold is a rhinovirus, which is one of the most commonest. It's self-limiting, 5 to 10 days. Antimicrobials have uh, no role because it's a viral infection and uh, it simply spreads through dro droplet infection. Uh, sore throat like pharyngitis, tonsillitis are also mostly viral in 90% uh, of the patients and the rest 10% could be bacterial, commonly group A, beta hemolytic uh, streptococcus, one of the common ones. So the oral manifestation, these um, pharyngitis or tonsillitis is, uh, you could have small round erythematous macules on soft palate and enlargement of lymphoid tissues. Could be because patient's throat is sore and then you could see it extend to the soft palate and the uh, you know uh, the adjacent areas bacteria retained on toothbrushes and orthodontic appliances and dentures and hence is recommend oral hygiene is very uh, very critical during uh, the phase when you're actually going through a sore throat and it's important that you change your brush and recommend your patient to change their brush after they have uh, you know suffered from an acute phase of respiratory infection it could be three days of sore throat or um, pharyngitis laryngitis important to change your toothbrush because you only brush with your toothbrush you don't actually disinfect it each time you brush it and hence bacteria which remain on the toothbrush could actually reinfect the same person again allergic rhinitis uh, <clears throat> this is again very common um, especially with the level of pollution that is seen in the air Chronic current inflammatory, recurrent, sorry, inflammatory disorder of nasal mucosa. It could be a type 1 allergic hypersensitivity. Uh, it is, in fact, sorry, uh, a reaction to environmental triggers. Various people have various triggers, right, from dust to pet dander to so many other things. And most prevalent chronic medical disorder It is one of the most. And oral manifestations is uh, because of the use of decongestions and antihistamines, uh, this leads to oral dryness. It could be temporary, but the effects could be uh, seen in the form of uh, bad malodor or caries. And also canidal infections in patients who are having long-term topical corticosteroid sprays. Allergic respiratory hypersensitivity uh, to methacrylates or a natu natural latex rubber allergy so you should it's important to note these cross allergens then uh, moving on to sinusitis it's inflammation of epithelial lining of the paranasal sinuses uh, this is a picture showing you all the sinuses that are seen in the head and neck region the old manifestations would be patient presence with toothache um, in case there's more than one tooth involved it's important to rule out uh, odontogenic cause uh, so patient is not able to point pinpoint or tell you which tooth it is or is telling you that the upper teeth are generally premolars and molars are painful and he's also having a very heavy uh, cold and stuffy nose and it's important to you know rule out <clears throat> sinusitis chronic sinusitis patients generally tend to do mouth breathing and hence there is oral dryness and gingivitis long-term antibiotics patient could develop resistance so for odontogenic infections if in case the patient is suffering an odontogenic infection and is also resistant to some of the most common antibiotics it's important to switch to a different class of antibiotics rather than increasing the dose which may not help and most importantly avoid smoking lower respiratory tract infections now this is this is a huge plethora of diseases i won't be able to cover all of them in this but some of the examples are chronic bronchitis pneumonia bronchiolitis for example the oral manifestations would be aspiration of saliva secretions oral bacteria in dental plaque which can cause pneumonia so that's why hospitalized patients which have generally having poor oral hygiene have a chronic lung infection again and again and hence this has been realized and uh, that's why it's important that the nurses uh, ask the patients to maintain oral hygiene by at least gargling especially patients who are on ventilators or who are uh, having difficulty in movement uh, and not able to brush efficiently uh, mouthwashes play a very very critical role here uh, looking at asthma it's an inflammatory disorder of the airways one in five children in malaysia develop asthma in childhood which of course is only childhood asthma and as they grow up it might actually uh, disappear um, get better recurrent ir uh, reversible airflow limitation and airway hyper responsiveness uh, dental products can exacerbate the condition for example toothpaste fissure sealants tooth enamel dust during tooth preparation uh, methyl methacrylate example so all of these could trigger an asthmatic episode for your patient so rubber dam plays an important role um, but again yes it can uh, trigger asthma in any ways a nasal uh, respiratory obstruction mouth breathing could be a problem 
and development of long tapered facial form and narrow maxillary arches as a result of that if uh, in, in children especially decreased salivary flow candidiasis gingivitis periodontitis increased dental caries especially with beta agonists and sugar containing antihistamines so uh, generally these are given to children to help ease the stuffiness and the the cold like symptoms and that's what happens they all contain sugar in them and if the child is actually taking them at night time and sleeping then you are having uh, definitely going to see more uh, the increased dental caries so some important things that you need to tell your patient is oral hygiene maintenance after inhaler use remember these steroid containing inhalers generally make the mouth dry and uh, and if the patient is again like i told you taking the puff and and sleeping at bedtime directly without brushing the oral oral cavity it could lead to a uh, high caries index fluoride supplements that's why are important antifungals can be used because there is invariably uh, candidal overgrowth that can happen in patients who are constantly put on um, oral steroids <clears throat> steroid prophylaxis in patients using long term steroid uh, systemic steroids uh, that's important again we'll look into that when we're going uh, to uh, patients on steroid treatment barbiturates and narcotics should be avoided because they act as bronchoconstrictors and can further increase the chance of patient uh, going into asthma patient appointments preferably in the late mornings uh, and to reduce stress careful use of suction tips and rubber dams you do not want to uh you know unnecessarily trigger asthma actually rubber dam could be quite stressful for pa these patients 10 percent asthmatics are allergic to aspirin and nacids um it's important that you make a note of that if your patient is having an allergy and synergistic effect of epinephrine and beta 2 antagonists increase blood pressure and arrhythmias in these patients so there could be drug interactions with theophylline patients who are on theophylline macrolide antibiotics increase theophylline levels Phenobarbitols reduce levels of theophylline, and tetracyclines have more side effects when given with theophylline. So it's important to note if your patient is on theophylline. Uh, in case of an acute asthmatic attack, again, this is just a very brief uh, description here. First of all, discontinue dental procedure. The patient should be in a comfortable position. Airway should be open. Administer beta antagonists, uh, agonists, sorry, and uh, oxygen. If no improvement, subcutaneous epinephrine should be given. and of course alert emergency medical help uh, um that is the class uh, for uh, today i hope you've taken note and uh, any doubts kindly uh, feel free to ask okay thank you